Hello and welcome to another episode of The the Edge presented by The Bluntness. Here we take you behind the scenes with amazing people who are pushing the boundaries in cannabis today. I'm your host, Gregory Fry, executive editor at The Bluntness, and today I have a very special guest, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. If you're not familiar with Dr. Peter Grinspoon, he is a Harvard-trained primary care doctor, cannabis consultant, corporate and scientific advisor, health and wellness coach, and author of the book, Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction, a memoir where Dr. Peter reveals some very tough and redemptive chapters of his life, which have become a big part of his work today. If you would like to learn more or even book a coaching session with Dr. Grinspoon, you can check out his website at petergrinspoon.com. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. For the people who aren't familiar with, with your, your story and your work, I wonder if we could just start out with um, the highlights, if you will, of, of your cannabis story. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I've been involved in this issue my entire life probably for two reasons. One, um, most poignantly, is that my brother Danny uh, fought a losing battle with leukemia. I was eight years old at the time, and my parents illegally, during Nixon's war on drugs, bought him medical cannabis, and it was the only thing that enabled him to hold down food for the last year of his life. I mean, it really allowed him to live in comfort, relative mm -hmm. comfort if you have cancer, and die in, with dignity. So I've been sort of a firsthand witness to how transformative medical cannabis can be like with my own eyes. So I've been in favor of it my whole life. So I entered medical school, um, you know, sort of immunized against all the nonsense they stuff into doctors' heads about cannabis. And I've been sort of in favor of it my whole my whole career. And the other reason is that my father was a, a, a very um, famous activist, Dr. Lester Grinspoon. There's actually a strain of cannabis named after him, Dr. Grinspoon is named after him not after me, but it's still pretty cool. Um, and he, you know, he wrote the book Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971 that um, really argued very strenuously and scientifically in favor of legalization. And he dedicated the last 50 years of his life toward the legalization movement and made a lot of progress. Um, he also published like hundreds of papers and another book called Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, which in the 1990s, which was quite influential in um in getting physicians to start to reconsider uh the importance of cannabis as a you know as a relatively safe and non-toxic plant-based medicine so i've been involved in this personally and professionally and sort of politically my my entire life so. mm. your your father dr lester grinspoon is actually a hero of mine Me and too. i i <laughs> i felt so blessed to have a chance to interview him back in 2015. Um, and I wonder if we could just if we could just talk about him and his work for, for a, a moment um, because I think it's worth remembering and celebrating and, and um, you know his you said something to me that um, you said something that about how his book really upset the Nixon administration and Nixon even uh, considered your dad an enemy, which uh, I wonder if we could unpack that a little bit, what you remember from, from that period. Well, you know, Nixon had that famous quote, you know, Christ, what's wrong with the Jews? They're all in favor of um, legalizing marijuana. And that was clearly referring to my dad because um, this really smart reporter at the Boston Globe did a Freedom of Information Act and got Nixon's briefing. And he circled my dad's name and said, this clown is far to the left when there was a briefing, Nixon's daily briefing about my dad's book, Marijuana Reconsidered, which was getting a lot of attention. It was um, reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review in as positive terms as a book can possibly be reviewed, which is pretty remarkable because at that point, um, 
the uh, twelve percent of Americans believe that cannabis should be legal. Now it's like sixty nine percent. So it was a very courageous book to write. And uh, you know, Nixon at that point was really uh, trying to fan the flames of his war on cannabis. So the last thing he wanted was this really intelligent, um, sort of charismatic psychiatrist at Harvard coming out with a popular, readable, and like immaculately researched and argued book, arguing that what's dangerous is criminalizing cannabis, not necessarily cannabis per se. So uh, it, yeah, it didn't go over that well with Nixon. It, it went over very well with a lot of other people, but just not with that particular person. Uh, so. Yeah, there's a, a special place on my dartboard for for Nixon photos. <laughs> um, if I that's a joke, I don't have a dartboard. Your father was also uh, friends and colleagues with with the late Carl Sagan, who I just love to bring up anytime I get a chance. And of course, it came out after Sagan passed that he was a, a very fond of, of cannabis use, despite his. Uh, or actually maybe um, in addition to his, his uh, public work, his prolific work with, you know, at Harvard and with NASA and so on. And um, talk about stigma busting when you, when you think of the Carl Sagan's of this world um, using cannabis for uh, relaxation or creativity or what have you. And I, and I wonder if you could, I know you grew up a little bit around Sagan and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the, your impressions and what you remember, and especially the, the cannabis part. Well, there's a, first of all, there's an awesome um, picture in the background of my Twitter page of me sitting on his lap and him teaching me to read. Um, mm. I always joke about how I was teaching him to read, <laughs> 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 teaching me to read. But um, he actually wrote the most powerful chapter in my dad's book, Marijuana Reconsidered but it was under the name Mr. X because he wasn't out of the cannabis closet. And after he passed away, my dad uh, made it public that he was Mr. X. And anybody who hasn't read that essay uh, by Carl Sagan that was in my father's book, Marijuana Reconsidered, should read it because if there was, if there's ever any doubt that cannabis can stimulate creativity and uh, sort of intellectual uh, discovery, this uh, chapter that Carl wrote is we'll put an end to that doubt. I mean, it's easy to find. Just Google Carl Sagan, Mr. X, scientific creativity it pops up in a million different places. And it's just the most phenomenal chapter. It's just a short essay about how he would uh, smoke and then he'd have all these ideas and he'd write them down because he thought that cannabis uh, would suppress our left brain so that our right brain, which is the creative part of our thinking, would really flourish. And then the next day he'd have to go back and edit the ideas some of which were nonsense and some of which were very profound insights that he never would have gotten without the cannabis. So it wasn't like every single thought he had was brilliant, but uh, some of the thoughts he never would have achieved otherwise. And it's just a really amazing book. But yeah, I remember them smoking all the time at my house when I was growing up and, you know, there'd just like always be a plume of marijuana smoke and the most brilliant uh, discussions. Like I can't even convey how, um, deep and uh, intellectually charged the atmosphere was in my house. And, you know, it was really interesting. There was a lot of like cognitive dissonance for me because then I go to school and the same old tired uh, policeman would be like, cannabis makes you amotivational and dumb. And, you know, the policeman seems sort of amotivational and dumb. And then I go home and then there'd be like these really brilliant intellectuals in my house smoking cannabis and having these electrifying conversations and like publishing books. It wasn't just Carl Sagan, it'd be like Allen Ginsberg or like all these people wow. publish books on like the bestseller list. And so the message that I saw was so different from like the message that I received. And it didn't take long for me to realize what was propaganda and what was like sort of reality. I mean, kids are smart. They're not, kids are in some ways smarter than adults. They can tell when they're being deceived. So I learned in early age, partially thanks to Carl Sagan and a lot of the other people that were populating my living room, um, sort of the truth about cannabis. And I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, your, your dad told me this when I got to interview him. He didn't actually try cannabis until after he published his, his book. And, and um, you know, he, he was at faculty parties and there was always a circle there, a cannabis circle. And he, he 
he, he, he passed on it. And eventually Carl Sagan uh, convinced him to give it a try and then they became smoking buddies. And you, your dad actually told me a story um, about him and Carl, which you, you may have heard this, but I think it's worth, worth sharing anyways. Any story uh, I've heard a thousand times, believe me. <laughs> um, it's worth sharing. So the story goes, uh, they used to meet for dinner with, with their wives uh, regularly and, Dr. Lester Grinspoon would have a couple of joints in his, his pocket, one for before the meal they would share together and one for after um, him, him and Carl Sagan. And after dinner one night, uh, Sagan asks him if he could he could take the second joint home with him because he he wants to finish up the, the last couple chapters of his book. And the, I'll never forget that that anecdote just. You know, it, it comes brings us back around to, to the concept of, of learning how, how to use cannabis uh, in a creative, productive way. And you you can't ask for a better model than, than the Carl Sagan's of this world. Yeah, he he's uh, more intelligent than I think many of the prohibitionists put together. You know, added <laughs> it's true and i just remember them smoking and uh carl would always have a little microphone a little recording device and they'd be talking then he'd be like oh hang on a second then he'd be like you know humans evolved out of the savannah in the 11th century you know he has some insight that he would record then he put his microphone away then he'd return to the conversation and absolutely i mean i saw that in in action and you know it certainly um was a lot more compelling than the um, sort of uh, prefabricated anti-drug message, you know, and that's sort of the tragedy of it all. That's sort of the tragedy of it all because there are some drugs that have some really serious dangers that teens need to learn about. And the whole D.A.R.E. program, they just lied so blatantly about cannabis that the kids would experiment with cannabis and then they'd know that none of this was true and then they'd ignore the messages, which some of which were very important about alcohol, about heroin, about cocaine, about other drugs. And if you're going to do drug education, tell the truth. Don't lie to teenagers. The minute you blow your credibility, it's gone. The teenager is never going to listen to you again. I mean, I don't get where they came up with the idea, let's lie to teenagers about cannabis, and then that'll stop them from using it. It's like, it's like the most brainless thing I've ever heard of it. And it, it just completely backfired. Yeah, and if you are going to be addicted to or leaning on a substance, uh, cannabis is a pretty good option um, compared to a, a lot of other things out yeah. there, even cheeseburgers. Yeah, some people do get in trouble with cannabis. There's no question. Um, mm. You know, and no substance is free of of any harm. But yeah, no, I mean, we I use it sometimes in my practice for harm reduction. I mean, if you could get someone off of alcohol and onto cannabis, that's a, a big win. Um, you know, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, people use drugs, you know, um, electively and not in a dependent fashion, not to escape from anything. And we all exercise and eat tofu and use our yoga mats, but we're people and we suffer and most people need something. And if you could steer people towards, you know, the least harmful substance, that's a huge win. You know, harm reduction is a huge, a huge uh, belief of mine. And I think there's, there's something to be said about um, the healthy, healthy exploration of altered states, whether you're using cannabis to achieve that or, or meditation or exercise or, or playing with your kids or, um, you know, the list goes on and, and I, I wonder if you have any thought of, about that as, as a, as a physician and a human being, uh, um, you know, the, the altered state. <laughs> well, that's funny. There's what I'm supposed to say as a physician. Then there's what I really believe, <laughs> but there's been no society that hasn't had intoxicants. I mean, it's just, you know, and you can make a strong argument that like, as you say, experimenting with altered states has been part of our cultural and religious history since our very beginning. And the key, you know, I just think this like, you know, jihad that we've had against all 
drugs is just absolutely ridiculous. People should be allowed to experiment. And as long as they're doing it in a responsible way, they're not harming anybody. There's really nothing wrong with it. Um, people are educated about the potential side effects and the harms. And, um, you know, whoever had the idea of criminalizing drugs, that's been absolutely insane. Drugs are not a law enforcement issue. Law enforcement makes everything worse. If people get into trouble with drugs, it should be handled by doctors, nurses, social workers, um, public health officials, not by law enforcement. I and mean, how does it help any situation ever to give people a criminal record? It just leads to more criminality and to desperation, which will make you need to be even more dependent on drugs. You treat people with compassion, empathy, and and treatment if they need it. So I think that all drugs need to be legal. Uh, we need to educate people so they can avoid the harms. We need to treat people if, if harms accrue. That would be much more cost-effective and much more humane than any possible outcome with law enforcement. Yes, I think part of our nature is to explore. And again, we make all these other drugs illegal, and then people are allowed to use alcohol, which is like the lowest common denominator. Like, I just can't for the life of me understand why people – I mean, my theory is that people use alcohol because cannabis has been illegal. I mean, cannabis is so much healthier – more interesting and more productive drug than alcohol. And I think that alcohol is just a default because people, again, need something. Again, in a perfect world, we'd all exercise, meditate, and do yoga, but most people need something. And the only default has been alcohol. And I think a lot of people are transitioning to cannabis because it sort of connects you with other people and lifts you up as opposed to just dulls you and makes you a zombie. So I agree with you about... Um, the uh, tendency of people to want to explore altered states. And I, again, there, as a doctor, there are healthier ways to do it and less healthy ways. And part of my job is to not be a Puritan or be totally unrealistic and just be like, just say no. And then all that accomplishes is that nobody tells me what they're doing and they do it anyways. That's just dumb. My way, my thing is to foster the lines of communication being open and to encourage people to do it in the self, the healthiest and safest way possible so that they can grow and flourish and not harm themselves. And if any harms come, to treat them with empathy and compassion. So I agree with you completely. We've got a pretty good model for that in Portugal, where they decriminalized all substances about 20 years ago. Um, and now they have, the, I think, the, the, the best rates in Europe in terms of least amount of, of drug overdoses and, and you know, health issues uh, related to drug use, right? And from my understanding, we have a spectacular model of how not to do it in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, millions of people in prison for no reason, rotting away for nonviolent crimes, huge overdose rates on uh, synthetic opiates. If drugs were legal, nobody would be dying. I don't understand what's so complicated about that. It's only mm -hmm. the reality that's making it so toxic and it's just a big moralistic component to this like people who are addicted are these happy hedonists but no they're just miserable people that need treatment i've been there i know what it's like and punishing people is just like the worst thing you could do it's like adding plutonium onto the fire and we just need a complete attitude change about this portugal's got it right the u.s has got it wrong completely yeah we should with humility just say, we're wrong about drugs from beginning to end. Portugal, what can you teach us? That's what the United States should be saying. Yeah. The knowledge gaps there are, are baffling. Right. And humility um, isn't the United States' is a strong point. <laughs> so, <laughs> One of its many, many uh, strong points, uh, humility. This is a perfect segue to the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. You, you've mentioned how doctors, uh, phys physicians, health practitioners, really, they have a responsibility here to use their, their respect and their prestige to help, help move the needle on these issues. And I wonder, what are you saying uh, from the front lines in, in this regard? Well, you know, I spend a lot of time working on these different issues. I, with respect to addiction, I do my best to destigmatize it. You know, I'm make no secret about the fact that I was addicted to opiates and, you know, especially among healthcare workers, it's so stigmatized. And because of that, a lot of people suffer in silence and it's just awful. 
And we have such a punitive reaction to it. Uh, doctors and nurses get punished instead of treat, treated the minute they ask for help, which is the exact wrong way to go about it. Like if you're going to get punished, if you ask for help, you don't ask for help. It, a two-year-old can figure that out. So I'm trying to like just destigmatize it and try to change it so that hopefully the medical boards and the nursing societies and the medical societies can sort of enter at least the 18th century, if not the 21st century and treat people with like compassion, not punishment. So that, because what's dangerous is when people don't get help. If someone gets help and they're monitored and treated, they're not dangerous. Your eyes are on them. You're treating them. They feel like they can tell you if they're having trouble. But what's really dangerous is if someone isn't, doesn't feel they can get help and they secretly swallowing pills or drinking before work. So I work really hard to destigmatize mental health issues and addiction in general and among healthcare providers. I mean, in general, anybody can get addicted. If your friendly doctor can addicted, get addicted, believe me, anybody can. And then for the drugs, starting with cannabis, they just have to be legal. And legal doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. I mean, they need to be regulated. For one, um, and this gets me gets uh, some people in the cannabis industry mad at me, but I don't think cannabis should be advertised, but I don't think alcohol should be advertised. I don't think tobacco should be advertised. And I certainly don't think that big pharma should be allowed to advertise their medications. I'm in the office all the time and patients see these things on TV and they're like, oh, I hear that this drug does this. And I'm like, but A, your health insurance won't pay for it because it's like 50,000 times more expensive than drug B that does the same thing. And B, they forgot to tell you that it does X, Y, and Z, which is really horrible. I mean, it's so misleading, the advertising. So I just... I think we need to legalize these things, educate people, like real education, not drug war propaganda, and regulate them, you know, tax them, use the taxes to take care of any harms that come up. And you don't have to advertise things that people, you don't have to punish people for using them, but you don't have to advertise them to increase the use. And, you know, make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep um, teenagers from getting access to them and so forth. Though with legalizing cannabis so far, the use has gone down, not up, which is, or it stayed about the same, actually, and in some cases, maybe gone down a little bit. But, you know, they're really sane and sensible things you could do. So I, I work a lot on that. Um, you know, just yesterday, I, I helped um, some of the activists in, in Alabama, a very conservative state. Um, they're just trying to get the most rudimentary medical cannabis uh, law passed. And it's so sad, like a lot of these people don't have access even to the most basic uh, medical cannabis uh, uh, provisions. And, you know, why have people suffer? I mean, the only people that are against it, like 94% of Americans are in favor of medical cannabis. It's just these commercial interests. It's the private prison industry, which you don't have in other countries. It's like insane. We have private prisons. They make money off incarcerating people. It's the alcohol industry. It's big pharma. Um, and mostly it's the rehab industry and law enforcement. They funnel so much money into the anti-cannabis legislation. It has nothing to do with health and safety. Um, it never did. So anyways, I do spend a lot of time on, on the social issue of trying to get these things legalized because uh, that's really the way to minimize the harm. The, the vested interests of prohibition engaging in legalized bribery. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow,